Welcome to the 50th episode. Woo! <laughs> I'm really excited and thank you so much for being here and being a part of this podcast journey. And I'm so excited about coming this far and making 50 episodes, of course, with the help of my guests and you, the listeners, who continue to come back and support me and all of us. I wanted to offer something special for the 50th anniversary episode. So my offer here is I'm going to offer $50 dance movement sessions for up to 50 people for the next 50 hours. So if you would like to try a dance movement therapy session with me, you can grab that for $50 only for the next 50 hours. And the way that you can do that is you can email me at orit.dmt at gmail.com. Or I'm going to paste a link below that goes right to the contact form through my website. This offer is only available for new clients and you must purchase the session within 50 hours. All right. Uh, I just have one more announcement. Another reminder that I'm hosting a webinar next Tuesday, July 24th. At 8 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time, reconnect to your body through dance and movement. I will paste the link below so you can look at the details and either sign up to join me live or to get the recording if you can't make it. So for the 50th episode, I am so happy and so honored to have my dear supervisor, Christina Devereaux, back on the podcast. She first appeared on episode number two, The Power of Pausing, if you want to go back and check that out. And today she is giving us real stories of dance movement therapy, sharing her own stories and stories from her students and supervisees from what it really looks like to be in the field and the front lines of being a dance movement therapist. This conversation was awesome and so many practical tips in here. Um, Whether you're a dance therapist or you're a body-oriented therapist or a creative arts therapist of a different modality. Enjoy episode 50. This is Mind Your Body, a dance movement therapy perspective on the integration of our emotional, cognitive, physical, and spiritual aspects of our being into one more aware and whole existence. Uh, My name is Christina Devereaux, and I am a dance movement therapist. And so far in my career, I have worked with people from a wide spectrum, from zero to 99 years old, um, different cultures, abilities, strengths, challenges, and and individuals, siblings, families, and groups. And I've also worked with residential facilities, schools, schools in day treatment facilities, in hospitals, and also in outpatient clinics. So I've also served as a supervisor, working with students and new professionals and seasoned practitioners from different areas of the country and also internationally, um, China, Hong Kong, Germany, Spain, Canada, and New Zealand, each of them really supporting a variety of people through the movement process. So the stories that I hear are, are heartwarming and actually kind of heroic in some respects mm-hmm. and really give me so much faith in the power of the human spirit and, um, you know, the, the co-created gifts that unfold in dance movement therapy. So for someone who's not familiar with the profession, sometimes I think it's hard to fully understand exactly what a dance movement therapy session looks like or what the work entails. So I suspect every dance therapist has their own story about interactions with others about the profession and interesting comments. You know, for example, I I've heard, Oh, do you do therapy for dancers or <laughs> are you, a phys- right? You're laughing. Are you a physical therapist or do you wear your tights to work? <laughs> You know, do you have, you know, do you have your own story about that? I'm sure. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know if I want to share. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So, I mean, it makes sense that there's confusing, there's confusion about the profession as a, as the word dance often elicits our own experiences Mm. of dancing from our own cultural context. 
And so we try to put it into context that we can understand. So mm. I thought it might be useful to hear some dance movement therapy vignettes or stories. So to speak to help paint a picture of this multifaceted nature of the work and how it could look differently depending upon its participants, the relationship, and identify some common threads that really underscore the shared values of the profession. While, you know, sessions might look and feel unique to the clinical encounter, the lens of a DMT remains. So we, we see the work through a common set of glasses, kind of, so to speak. Um, you know, whether a client is breathing with you in a chair or dancing together with you to a popular song, one common value is shared. Movement is communication. Movement can be metaphor or how we are in the environment, a metaphor for that, or in a relationship. And moving in relationship can help us discover or uncover or transform new ways of relating to ourselves and to others. Mm -hmm. So also the creative process in and of itself can be transformative and within a safe relationship. So, so that's my intention sort of, of inviting deeper dialogue about what the, the picture might be. And, you know, I'm fortunate to hear over and over intimate moments or sort of like little gems, what I like to call them from supervisees that continue to put me in awe about the power of movement and this multi-layered co-created process. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> yeah. Well, great. <laughs> Speaking of your work with younger dance movement therapists, not younger in age, but younger in profession, what have you noticed are the biggest surprises for them when they enter the front lines of running dance therapy sessions? Well, I, I actually think most dance movement therapists, edu the education of a dance movement therapist has a developmental progression um, in training, meaning, you know, you aren't just learning theory and then plopped into the workforce, which is good. Um, and training happens progressively. So, and it can also deeply, we deeply value embodied understanding of the therapist. So I say this first because I think students are often progressively prepared for professional practice. They might not know it, but they are. And however, I always tell my students that after they have left their educational training and internship experience, and then they start their first job, kind of to see it as their third internship, mm -hmm. you know, meaning like there's still much to learn, but the students that are now professionals are now navigating the work on their own you know, with supervision, hopefully. But many newer professional dance movement therapists are surprised, I think, by the level of communication and education that may need to happen in their workplace about the profession. I think for many, this misunderstanding or difficulty understanding what the DMT perspective is, it can be taxing. You know, navigating this outside the safety and security of the training program. And it can feel somewhat jolting and many of my supervisees who've more recently entered the workforce struggle with this. I mean, if the DMT perspective isn't understood or supported, some revert to more traditional approaches that might be more easily understood. And some question, I'm not really doing dance movement therapy because their sessions might look different or feel differently than what was practiced or explored in the classroom setting. But I do feel that the training in dance movement therapy supports the practitioner in examining the therapeutic process through a specific lens, as I described. And what is it in particular that describes a dance movement therapy session versus other body-based approaches or other psychotherapy uh, approaches, you know, or how is it similar? So I think this professional identity formation or who am I as a dance movement therapist now is a common focus in supervision with newer professionals. And, and for some, this is quite a surprise. Do you have any examples of what has felt like more dance therapy and what has, what kind of situations have helped or have caused 
your supervisees to ask, am I really doing dance therapy? Mm -hmm. I have a supervisee now that is working with children and adults in an outpatient clinic as a primary therapist. So she's the only dance therapist in her setting. Um, So she's surrounded by other um, disciplines, other mental health disciplines. And she noticed herself becoming frustrated with a male client, adult client. Um, she brought her feelings into supervision and we were able to explore more about the nature of what was going on in her therapy um, and his pattern of reaction and his history and his also his own cultural context. So no matter how much advice or work she gave the client, he never really followed through. And so she was feeling frustrated with him and annoyed that he wouldn't grow up. Mm -hmm. And in some respects to take responsibility for himself. And she felt like she was a badgering mother and concerned about being over overly smothering and something she knew deeply, of course, from her own family of origin. So the more we talk through these relational patterns that were playing out within the therapeutic relationship, I, in my mind, had this image of a baby and a mother, like playing peekaboo and engaging in a healthy reciprocal dance. And so I simply asked my supervisee, you know, have you, have you tried mirroring with your client where, where he can lead and you can follow and then you can lead and he can follow? literally a back and forth movement dialogue where each of you can understand each other. And I described what was coming up for me through my own imagery. And as she spoke about the relationship, she said, of course, no, Mm -hmm. I haven't. (laughs) And then she discussed more about how she sensed her professional identity, as I was describing as a dance movement therapist, it gets murky. And so we talked about her own movement life, her own engagement and improvisation and her own expressive outlets for herself. And this seemed to be a turning point for her um, with this client. So while she was sitting in the room with him, having these dialogues, um, she wasn't feeling like she was being a dance movement therapist. But once she had this lens again to look at what was what was playing out, then she started to report Um, more creativity in their work together and in some respects more play and in response the client indicated to her in a recent session that he's following through on tasks and he's feeling more creative and Mm. in many ways was indicating that the movement process together had provided him a broader repertoire for navigating his life so whatever what whatever was getting in the way within that relationship was some of my supervisee's own professional identity confusion. And the more we grappled with this, the more freed up she was to follow her impulses, to engage in and trusting that the creative process in and of itself was therapeutic. And ultimately, it freed up the client as well. So this is just one example. Hmm. So was was it the doubt that there was value in just this creative process or that it wouldn't be accepted by other. I think for her, it was sort of being surrounded by other, like my other professionals that were looking at the case in one from one lens. Mm -hmm. And the more that she could remind herself or, or use the, the lens that was from her training, it did allow her to see the relationship as a dance. And then it freed up, her own ability to be to match her impulses and to follow her own creative gestures and she's she's really taken to that and I think that her client specifically has started to unfold Mm -hmm. in in new ways because of it and is speaking about hey what we're doing in here is really helping me and it's not traditional yeah yeah that's a great reminder to to come back to our lens and trust our lens that we spent a lot of time training and studying in and practicing. Are there any surprises or mismatches that you've um, heard from your supervisees about um, theory that they've learned in their programs versus the application of that and the practice on, on site or in the field? I I don't know. I think actually that whole Um, developmental time 
is a time to really deepen their own beliefs about what is it about dance and movement that is healing and elicits change for them. Um, and sort of a, a theoretical perspective that they, that we might have learned in our training, there might be elements of that that really are our own truth, but there are also exposures to other perspectives that's really shape us as who we are as a clinician. And some of that might align really with early historical theoretical models of DMT, and some of it might not. It might be moving into different trends and curiosities about where other other disciplines are looking, and that's fine. I think you can hold both. Yeah. How long do you would you say is a pattern of how long your supervisees have taken to really ground in their identity and their approach? Oh, I, th- I think that's certainly individualized. You know, I, I have some supervisees that just seem to be deepening every day and as they're, as they're growing, the more curious they are about themselves, the more connected connections they're making, um, the more invested they are in their own self-reflection and engaging in their own process. But there are some that, it, of course, it takes longer because they're still grappling within themselves about where they want to be and where the work is. So I think that's definitely personal about timeline. Mm-hmm. Are there things that you can say that are more widely helpful with the transition and with, with that process? The transition and finding your own identity? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I really believe that the um, development of a therapist, myself included, requires um, constant reflecting on your own life transitions, your own life um, encounters, the things that push us the assumptions, the biases, the movement preferences that we have. I think it requires ongoing supervision or checking in, whether that's therapy, whether that's your own supervisory experience or peer group from whatever perspective. I just think sometimes if we're, if we're doing it alone all the time, then we could stay isolated perhaps in our own, our own assumptions and bias and preference. I've definitely experienced that (laughs) as we've been meeting for about five years now. So (laughs) I'd say it's definitely been helpful. And there, I can go through patterns of thought that kind of cycle around each other about certain situations and not find a new perspective or a new direction or clarity until I talk to you about it or even if I talk to another peer about it. Mm Mm-hmm. It's just so helpful to, like you said, not stay alone with it. Mm-hmm. Good. I'm yeah. glad to know that. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what kinds of experiences do you find your supervisees bring to you as being, you know, the most successful, quote unquote, or they're the most proud of? Yeah, I, I'm glad you said quote unquote success because I think success is subjective, right? It's such a subjective experience. It's very personal. And I think this also depends upon our development in our clinical training as well as what is success within the particular context. So, for example, um, a successful session might be that the client reached out and initiated interaction for the first time or as a therapist I made it through the group without anyone leave, right? (laughs) Or this might be a time when through support, a client may have a deeper level of insight into a challenge. And that might feel like a real gem or success. I had a supervisor recently talk about how she's starting to note the times where she's simply having a maintenance session versus moving the client along And this distinction for her, I might say, describes her success that, um, however, there are times, you know, specifically in some acute settings, you might even encounter this, that where the focus is on maintenance of here and now and diving into intrapsychic conflict isn't responsible, but the role is to keep the work in the moment for some settings, right? And, and to support social engagement and deepen that connection. So 
So that can feel powerful to feel successful. But I think when I feel, when I feel successful, it's when there has been some unfolding or transformation. And this could be seeing something in a new way or experimenting or, or exploring movement in a different way or joining together in a new way. So if I see um, something happen or unfold, that's, this was, this was a shift then I feel that those are my little successes. So I don't know. I'd love to hear your perspective on this, perhaps. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, I am in a setting at the moment. Um, I perceive success within a one-time session because no yeah. two groups are ever the same. So um, what feels successful to me is seeing changes in affect, in mood, and feeling an energy shift from the patients, even within the first five minutes of the session, and especially from, you know, beginning to end where we start out sitting or I, I come into a room of people who um, are looking withdrawn and um, more closed off as I can observe from body posture and body language. And then, you know, we end up standing up and moving and closer physically and closer, um, you know, emotionally and people are spontaneously moving and smiling and laughing with each other. And then they verbalize how, how helpful the sessions are or how helpful the session was for them. But even just like observing that non-verbally, I think is the most powerful for me. And there's definitely some pride there that I was able to contain the space and um, allow this to happen. But then there's also, I know that that can't happen without the group of people who are also willing to open up and go a little bit deeper and share a little bit more of themselves with the rest of the group. So, well, it's co created, mm -hmm. but I also think that requires a real deep listening on the therapist's end to the type, the different kinds of holding of the therapeutic environment. I think my role as a therapist is to decipher how strong or light the holding might need to be for each clinical moment, really. Mm -hmm. And like, it's on a continuum holding, you know, holding meaning psychic holding. I don't mean literal holding. Um, and, th and this is in and of itself, I think the beauty of the dance that you're talking about and requires, I look at my own boundaries, my own assumptions, my own preferences. For example, in a group therapy, sometimes my groups feel like they need to feel held through a clear identified structure. So let's begin this way as a structured warm up. Let's move through each body part in a sequential fashion. And then the group will give me indicators that there's safety and comfort and in that room. So then you can loosen the hold and kind of breathe into it a bit and hold and support the space for authentic expression and in complexity. And then you might feel that the group needs my help to come back together and provide more holding. So I do feel like it's co-created, like it has to do with the reading and mm -hmm. I, changing a formation, a spatial formation, you know, if I'm, let's move out into space and pass by each other and greet each other and um, then prepare the group to close and we might need a stronger hold to build a container again. So I think you're saying, yes, the it's the makeup of the group, but it's not magic, you know, I think no. it has to do with the co-created holding dance that happens. Absolutely. From, yeah. And that's something where you're talking about how much do I hold is a big conversation piece in supervision with my supervisees about, you know, I kind of put in the perspective of what kind of leader do you have to be, you know, in this particular session or in these parts of the session. And it's especially because I supervise students in a facility that has such a wide range of population. One day they could be working with children and, you know, the next hour they could be working with patients who are struggling with addiction. So, yeah. so okay. the energy of those two groups are so different with the children. They're coming in with typically with uh, a bunch of ideas and energy and I want to do this and I have all these um, ideas of how and they're coming in with movement that you can just pick up right away. And it's, you know, pretty easy to just go with their flow if it if it doesn't need as much containment. And it's like they're giving so much expression that it's less than if you were on the adult unit and you have to kind of draw it out of them. And you have to be this different kind of leader where 
you're really having a strong, strong presence of leadership and structure and guiding them into, you know, whatever movement exploration is appropriate. And so if you're still the the group leader, the group facilitator, but your role can look so different, even just between those two groups. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So yeah, the quote unquote successes look so different in, <laughs> in different kinds of groups. Yeah. And your developmental level and also whatever the success is for the client, you know, it depends on, I've had, I worked with people with autism for many years and success in one session might mean this client reached out and made contact with me. And that was like a miraculous moment. And, and that's, that was a gem. Yeah. Well, one of the um, clients that we talked a lot about of mine that I talked about with you this past year, I can't remember, um, was my client who, um, who fainted a lot. Mm. And so it was, it was a success when, cause she used to faint when she was upset with me. If I didn't show up at, you know, the right time or the time that I said that I would, or if one time my, my iPod ran out of battery. So the music wasn't there and that was a huge thing. And so she just fainted and, that was a a huge thing of trying to help her understand and actually believe that it's okay to express um, her frustrations with me and her disappointments in me. And that, you know, that can be expressed differently than fainting. And so for me, it's success was eventually when she wasn't doing that anymore. She wasn't fainting anymore in her sessions. And she, I wouldn't say she completely initiated expressing her feelings, but with my facilitation, she was able to say, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm frustrated with you or you let me down in one way right. or another. Right. And if I remember from her history, she, she would go into dorsal vagal shutdown where she was, her body or nervous system was having a reaction as if she was in a state of life threat, because if there was feeling in the room from her, her family of origin experience, that would be a dangerous, life-threatening situation. So feeling to her meant literally leave my body, right? Or go go into face of face syncope. Mm-hmm. And instead, um, she started to brought herself back to life to some degree, right? And started to engage in behaviors that were more interactional but fight or flight. So she right. was becoming more sympathetically aroused. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that, was, that was a very interesting case. Yeah, yeah, it was. So what piece of advice do you find yourself giving most to the, the therapist that you supervise? I don't, ah, <laughs> this is a hard question. I don't know if I could really quantify this in terms of the most, but I think there are some top threes okay. um, scenarios. So, and this, of course, depends on the developmental level, I think. But number one, so I sort of feel like each relationship has its own dance. And we just need to figure out sometimes which one we're doing. You know, we might be uh, working and sort of this is met- metaphoric, but maybe with a client, we're doing the, the waltz and they're doing the tango. And we have no idea that we're dancing two totally different dances or we have to figure out kind of what the dance is that the client is is giving. So we, we have to learn that there are no recipes here. Every client has its own dance and we need to, we need to start to understand that. I also think another piece that we talk about a lot is that your body is a barometer (laughs) and your body, meaning the therapist's body. And to pay attention to your own physical sensations and feelings as clues as to what might be occurring into the clinical scenario. I, I I never forgot in my own graduate training when when I learned about somatic countertransference. And I thought, this is the secret of therapy. This is it. This is like, this is the the special sauce. You're telling me that if I pay attention to my own self, that I could perhaps, it could give me a clue as to what's going on in the room. And that to me is, that's it. The more I'm in touch with my own experience, the more I can decipher is this my own sort of subjective countertransference or my own subjective subjective experience from my own history? Or 
is there something about this that's becoming induced in me that's coming actually from the room or the from the relationship and that can be a real informant Mm -hmm. yeah and that's something that you've advised me a lot about and has been very helpful Mm -hmm. yeah and I was going to say that before in response to the co-creation it's not only in what I facilitate that's co-created and what they're giving me but it's every breath they take affects my breath in a way or like if I feel like I have to take a deeper breath or I'm getting short breath what is that information that I'm reading from them that's showing up in my body and then Mm -hmm. that's informing me of my next step of just for example having us all take a deep breath together exactly or slow it down or exactly and and I think we we need to know ourselves well and including our own assumptions our own biases and and our own preferences so is this something I know about myself this is kind of how I decompress I take this breath or this is something that that might be informing me so I I think they're all connected right because that piece of advice sounds really, really simple. Just sense Mm -hmm. your own body and what's going on. But it's so complex if you're you're not sure what what are the signs that your body is telling you or what do you usually do or what are your preferred movement qualities and how does that differ from the clients in the room or how Mm -hmm. is that affecting how you want to move versus how they, what their dance is. (laughs) What's that? Or what are we avoiding Mm -hmm. because of my own preference? Like, I don't like to go there. I don't like those fighting qualities, so I'm never going to take it there, right? Mm -hmm. Or I'm not going to support that, or I'm going to back off, or I'm going to move away from those movements. Right. Um, Or even fighting qualities in the tone of my voice as a therapist of, like, I'm saying no, but my voice is very indulgent and inviting more and more. Oh, no. Let's (laughs) stop that right now. (laughs) And so that obviously affects the containment and the safety of the session and possibly even the safety of you as a therapist. I think you named, did you name two or three? So um, the three that I was thinking about is sort of the relationship having its own dance. The body is a barometer. And then we need to know ourselves well, Uh including our own assumptions, biases, and preferences. They're related. They're all interweave. So those are my three. But I'm sure there are more. I'm going to start tracking them now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a little research. <laughs> yeah, it's a good idea. So I just want to make sure that the the first piece of advice is clear about the the dance between the... Yeah. Are you advising that no two situations are the same or right. that it takes some time to synchronize and stand well, the yeah, other person? That's a great distinctor. I think they're probably both equal. I think sometimes I hear, especially newer therapists are frustrated with a certain scenario and they say, what would you do? Or what do you do if, what do you do here? And, you know, I could say we could do this, but really this, every situation is unique. I mean, I certainly I have a lot of experience working with people with autism. And I always say, if you've seen one person with autism, you've seen one person with autism. There's no recipe for being able to in, um, intervene. Um, we have to learn the dance of the other first through, through you know, if I take two steps forward, what do you do? We have to learn what, what that dance is. It's unique um, in order to really know. So it's like a mystery. We have to sort of, we have to, we get to, we get to figure this out. We get to explore it. So that's, that's what I mean by that. But I actually like how you've expanded on it, that it takes time, that there's pacing and time to, to unfold and uncover what that really is. Right. Yeah. And I would, I would say the same thing for groups as well. Each, each group is its mm-hmm. own life form and yeah. what happened in even this same group yesterday is no, you know, barely an indication of how you might intervene today. Each or if different... this is happening in the group, this is what you do. This is the recipe. Right. So the pre- prescribed things that happen. Right. So you can get in a trap that way, I think. 
I think even this is a good topic to talk about too, even for more seasoned therapists, how do you find new ideas and not get stuck in, you know, the routine of what has worked and what hasn't because we can get comfortable after a certain point. Well, I think you actually spoke about something that I also I've talked about actually just recently um, with a supervisee. We were talking about the difference between a routine and a ritual. And when you say you can get stuck and comfortable, that to me feels like it's routine. Like think about what do you do in the morning? You brush your teeth, you do this, you do this. You kind of go through the motions and sometimes you don't really think about it and it doesn't really have intention. Like, well, yes, to brush your teeth and clean, prepare yourself for the day. But, but there's, there's a different level of intention than a ritual or a beginning that, um, or, a, or an engagement in something that has intention and purpose. So sometimes if we're using tools or props, are we bringing them out because they are, I can't think of something else to do or because this is something that has a therapeutic intention to support deeper connection or deeper engagement in something. And we can get really stuck in that, I think, if we aren't careful. Right. And also sensing the responses of the client or the clients in the room, if it still seems exciting and motivation and engaging versus like, uh, just going through the motions. Mm -hmm. It feels Mm -hmm. different. Yeah. The clients don't necessarily have to be um, excited in terms of joyous, but there, there might be some stimulus, Mm -hmm. affective stimulus that, means that there's some purpose and meaning so I there's also distinction there Mm -hmm. you know or uh, an assumption that if the clients aren't happy that nothing that they're not this isn't successful Mm. that therapy can be messy and sometimes I had a session once with a teenage girl and it was the most I felt one of my most successful sessions because she refused to talk to me the entire time (laughs) and it got to this beautiful place where she was starting to express her anger Um, first she held me hostage in some ways you know in the session around I'm, I'm going to be silent here I'm going to sit in this and so I got to reflect back Um, and experience in my body what she was holding and I got to reflect that back to her in a way and that was that was a turning point in our session and boy she was not excited or joyous (laughs) at all but I was so delighted that she was finally able to express she was silent but it, it came through in a way that I could translate that for her and then we were able to move on from that place where she was able to be more expressive about her anger which wasn't at me, it was to someone else. It was transference, of course, but we were able to make that connection. Yeah, that, that is a great distinction that you made. And I'm thinking about how much value there is in a session that's messy and that it's not necessarily excitement, but there's stimulation even in frustration. And thinking back to a session where I was using the Octoband with a group of mostly adult men, there was an abrupt falling apart and letting go of the octoband and everyone just kind of backing down and sitting down. And it it was like, all right, well, what happened here? And what, you know, why did this fall apart so quickly? And the metaphor, the theme that I was drawing was that it became intimate pretty quickly. And, and because holding the octoband required, you know, every person's hand in there, literally and metaphorically, I think one person backed out and said, I'm sitting down. And that was like a domino effect of, yeah, me too. I'm out of here. That was a great conversation to have. It was messy. You know, I didn't love that it fell apart. It would have been great if it just kept going. And it was, you know, it felt quote unquote positive, but um, this was now a conversation piece and we could talk about it. And what does it feel like when someone backs out? What does it make you want to do? You know, makes me want to back out too and, you know, screw them. They, we were all in this together and they walked out of this and that makes me feel frustrated. And, you know, all these simulation around that and this charge around 
relationships and abandonment and all that, yeah. all that stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And how wonderful that we could, we get to be in that place together and survive it. <laughs> yeah. And to say it's a safe place to explore. Exactly. Yeah. Anyway. So, yeah. So I want to ask you, what is your uh, personal favorite frontline story? Yeah. Oh my gosh. I have to say this is so hard because it's really hard to pick one moment or story, but you know, I've been reflecting on knowing this about this podcast and there are, there are a few stories I think I could share and that truly live in me still. And we're one of some of my greatest teachers I'm thinking about as we were talking about therapy as messy. um, I might be interested in telling you about my work with an eight year old boy who I worked with as a child therapist in a domestic violence agency and I'll call him Jack. So he was referred to me because he was getting in fights with his peers and some pretty severe altercations with his sister. And also his mother was very aware he had witnessed some horrific physical violence that he saw his father engage in towards her. So she wanted him to have an outlet to process his experiences and also help him manage his anger. So I think to some degree, his mother was actually starting to become afraid of him. And he, Jack, was starting to identify with the aggressor, his father. So the more I got to know him, the more I learned about his own underlying feelings, actually, of sadness and loss and fear of losing control and sense of worthlessness. But to complicate things, his father stopped picking him up for weekly visitation, and his father had a new girlfriend, and there was another baby along the way. So this, is, this was living in his body in many ways, uh, quite, quite a messy situation, I might say. Mm. So our work started where he was at. And at first, he was kind of appropriately cautious with me and pretty protective. And he was rejecting of most every interaction with me and would devalue anything that I did to try to join with him. So nothing was right. I couldn't ever meet his needs. And specifically mirroring his movements just angered him further. So don't copy me. Don't do what I do. You'll never do it right. Those kinds of statements I would hear. So I knew that this, that his rejection really was his way of sharing that he needed. I needed to stay at a distance and take pace and follow his pace. And so um, I would consciously place my body near him and more beside him rather than behind him or in front of him. So we were moving in parallel instead, and I did. I gave him a tool, kind of a medium-sized rubber ball that he, where he could start to channel some of his feelings and, and to mobilize them. And he would hit the ball against the wall, somewhat like he was playing like a game of handball, right? And for a while, he didn't allow me to join him in this game, but instead I would match his intensity with my voice. And in dance therapy, we call this intermodal attunement, like attuning to him through a different mode, right? So if he would strike the ball against the wall hard, I would match it like, I would, oh, I would, I would kind of match it with my voice. So I attuned in this way for a while until he, until he started to modify his own movement expressions. And, and he would see if I followed or changed my tone of voice. So slowly he was starting to allow me in. And then if I didn't match it just right, he would tell me, he'd say, he'd encourage me. And so I would say, can you show me? Teach me. Teach me the right way. So now he felt like the expert and he wanted me to understand what his experience was. So he invited me to join him in the dance with the ball against the wall. (laughs) And this became somewhat of a ritual for a few weeks until the dance with the ball wasn't against the wall, but it became about a pass to each other. And then eventually the ball disappeared and we were able to create our own ninja dances between us and we would try on each other's movements. And however, I could still never get it quite right, his moves. So Mm -hmm. he would correct me often and he would share, I would share with him how hard this was for me to never do anything right, which of course was his experience, right? Mm -hmm. And that's that trying that on in myself and, and reflecting it back so he could hear, um, he could hear his own voice in his head, right? 
And so we would engage in these dance explorations with imagery where we, we would move with different intensities and work on moving fast and slow and in slow motion and having instant replays, starting again, going into hyperspeed. We'd find a relaxed place on a desert island. So all of these kind of ways of moving and inviting really new a new range of repertoire in his body. So at times he would take charge that we, the ways that we would move, but he actually started to allow me to have some ideas and he would invite cues to help his body adjust. At other times he would, um, we would do some kind of dance freezes where he would be in charge of stopping and going, creating music to make one person move and things like that. I, I think he also felt that regardless of the intensity that he presented to me, he was accepted and he would take more and more risks with his body while taking pride. So one day he came into my office really angry. Something had happened at home, but he wasn't communicating about that. And he was holding his feelings and his, his body was tense and he was kind of tight. He was shut down and unresponsive to my attempts to engage him in verbal dialogue. But I sensed that he was craving connection with me. And it was clear that he needed to kind of release his feelings. So I just used the body here and I invited him to be the leader of a dance. And I said, I want you to move, move, you be the leader and move the way that you needed, he needed to move. And I could, I could watch him or, or I could move with him. And he starts his dance, his movements are strong and direct and he's flailing and his body was showing this emotional state and he was really rejecting me and joining him. And so I tried a lot of ways to kind of attune to him. And he, at one point, he just talked about holding and containing. He just started to kind of dysregulate to a place where he started throwing objects and he would tear paper in the room. And he was creating a mess, literally. And I would just reflect that. Of course, I was setting boundaries in some as well. But I see you're needing to make a mess. And I really felt that he needed to know how messy he felt inside. And at the end of the session... He, he kind of refused to clean up and was just like, no, and, and said I needed to, needed to leave the mess. And I felt that in some ways it was his way of saying, I need you to hold my mess. So this kind of ending ritual of creating messes and leaving them for me to pick up um, in some ways became a, a, a small ritual. And slowly he could witness me assisting him in cleaning the parts of this mess. And he started to internalize these intensities of the messiness. And I felt that in some ways, week after week, he left the room with less of a mess. And he then started to do some helping me in cleaning up. And so in, it, there, was this, there was this beautiful witnessing of kind of falling apart and being able to, to put himself back together. But during our last session, which is the most powerful, and this is a long vignette, I'm sorry about that, but he was drawn to this rock that was on my on my desk in a bowl, and he started to uh, do a little stone dance with it. So he's like dancing with the stone, tapping it on the desk. So I join him in the stone dance, and we start kind of tapping our stones in a clear rhythm together. And at one point during this dance, the stone broke open. Hmm. This is like a serious, <laughs> this is a true story. And one of those stones that kind of had like crystals inside or something. Yeah. And I, I, I saw this in irony as like a, a perfect symbolic reflection of his own process. So I chose to reflect that to him. And I just said, isn't it amazing on the outside? It can be so messy and dull and gray, but now when we see what the inside has revealed, there's so much beauty. And it was this synchronous, like, I'm not kidding. <laughs> this moment where I thought that was it. Yeah. He knew that I knew that he knew. He was talking about himself. He knew that you knew. That we all knew. <laughs> I knew that he knew that I knew. We all knew. It was a shared subjectivity, right? Mm. That this was himself. Mm. He understood what you, you, you were saying with that. 
reflection. Yeah, he did. Yeah, that's amazing. Perfect timing. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You get to I, keep the the stone? He did. He kept the stone. Mm-hmm. He was pretty enamored with the stone. So that was his little transitional object. How did you know that he knew? What was the indication? Uh, he, he looked at me right in the eye. He smiled. And he just shook his head. Hmm. That's beautiful. I love that. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Well, <laughs> one of my greatest teachers. What did he teach you? He taught me not to be afraid of the mess. Mm. And that there was something important about that. And of course, it wasn't that I was allowing him to create destruction. It was that he was needing to um, show me the complexity that he was holding. And I, I, once I started to understand that, I became less afraid. And I think he did too. And I think that's what his mother was experiencing. She was afraid yeah. of his complexity. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah, I have, I have another frontline story. I, I remember working in an inpatient psychiatric setting with a group of women, adult women. And during one particular session, I remember after kind of a body part warm up, one of the women started to stretch her arms out wide and she really created space between her and the other women. She was kind of reaching her arms in front of her and behind her. So I encouraged the group to give themselves space to explore their kinosphere or their space bubble around them. And so we, we painted this space with imaginary colors and explored how high the space was above them and how it was below them. And then we moved around this room, sort of honoring the colorful spaces that surrounded our bodies. And they started to talk about experiences when their spaces hadn't been honored and the colors of them had not been honored. And we moved into an exploration of saying, stop. And this is my space, um, really allowing them to use their body to feel that verticality of the stance of, no, this is mine, uh, honor me. And this was, this was a powerful expression, I think, that helped the women have an embodied rehearsal of defining a healthy boundary. And so then we came together as a full group and we started dancing to the song Respect by Aretha Franklin. And we delighted in our togetherness and the empowerment that we felt kind of moving and defining our own boundaries. So that that moment in that group, I felt it was an acute setting, but it was a singular session that I never forgot. Mm, I think I've heard that one before. Oh, yeah? I don't know. It sounds familiar. (laughs) Maybe you've had your own. Mm. It's amazing. (laughs) Like, Mm -hmm. what happens in metaphor and how symbolic it is of of what's going on in the moment of the session and what's going on in the moment in their lives. Yeah, actually, as you're talking about this, I, I feel compelled, actually, to share this experience I had when I was conducting a training group in in China during a course that I was teaching, if you don't mind. Mm-hmm. And so th- this wasn't a therapy group, but it was a class where there were some local children that were invited to the group to engage in some expressive movement. So, so I didn't know much about the children except that they were about five years old. And the mother of one of the children approached me before the group and told me in Chinese that her daughter was naughty. And that was the only information I knew. So as a blonde hair, blue eyed white woman who was a foreigner and doesn't speak Chinese, I knew that I had some pretty cultural differences to navigate. So we began the session with a a greeting, a little hello song and inviting each child one at a time to kind of show movement of how are you today? And of course I wasn't able to speak the language here. So I had a translator translating and this intervention went over like a lead balloon. 
The children like stared at me, were barely <laughs> moving. And one boy even moved to the edge of the room far away from me. But I persisted and I brought in a ball to help bridge the distance of support with them, of connection with us. So we slowly started to roll the ball to each other. And then we sometimes would pass the ball. But when I began to count in Chinese, e, a, son, and I would e, a, son, and we would do this in rhythm together, they started to connect to me. So I literally was starting to speak their language and our passes became quicker. And then we came to our feet and I explored the spatial difference between us. And we opened up the space and we would stay in connection even though we were at a distance. And then pretty soon I put on some rhythmic music and we started to march to a circle in and out and in and out. And then we took the march around the room and then we held hands and we were moving the circle in and out. And the movement process really has was a bridge to our relationship. And the theme and the exploration going forward continue to be about spatial distance, coming towards each other, going away, moving in and out. To me, it was like a very cultural representation of what we were living in the moment. Mm. And so we took out scarves and we explored greeting each other. Um, this gave us an opportunity to be an individual, but to find ways where we can connect and say hello. And the session closed and we came down to the low level on the ground and I put on some soft music and they allowed me to come near them, to sprinkle them with what I called magic resting dust. <laughs> and most of them allowed me to come close to them and they accepted my gift and used it as a way to kind of relax. And so I felt that they were taking me in as a person of safety. So we closed the session with a goodbye song. And it just, for me, it was an incredible opportunity to use movement as the primary language to cross cultural barriers. So you're talking about symbolic that mm -hmm. just for me was very symbolic. Yeah, that's fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, it's fun to reflect, you know, it's fun to reflect on those teachable moments. You know, I think our clients are our greatest teachers. Thank you so much, Christina. And thank you all for being here for the 50th episode. If you want to claim your dance movement therapy session for $50 in the next 50 hours, please email me at orit.dmt at gmail.com or click on the link below that says contact me for your $50 session. I'll see you next time. Bye.